to the keynote address, and I have the uh, pleasure of, of introducing uh, Tad Siegel. The title of his, uh, uh, of his talk is Communicating for Impact, and he's the president and founder of Outreach Strategies. I'm going to have to read this, so I apologize. Uh, so uh, Tad Siegel is a senior communications and advocacy strategist specializing in complex campaigns impacting public policy on sustainability issues at the international and domestic levels. As a mission-driven organization, Outreach Strategies is engaged in some of the most exciting and innovative uh, 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 media and outreach campaigns involved with stakeholder <coughs> engagement and in international educational campaigns to protect our air, land, and water both in the U.S. and across the world. With deep experience in a variety of environments, including large coalitions, agencies, corporate and government settings, he specializes in complex communication campaigns that impact public policy on sustainability issues. And his keynote address will address frameworks and approaches used in advocating for science-based decision-making. And with that, uh, please welcome Tad. Good morning. Good morning. Try that again. Good morning. Good morning. It's much better. How's everybody doing today? Everybody had their coffee? Excellent. All right. Um, <laughs> if uh, for some reason uh, I'm too loud or, or you need to turn this down, just let me know. I'll try to try to uh, uh, speak so that I'll definitely. Um, thank you for the introduction. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today uh, with the FEMC. Uh, I am so impressed with the quality of the speakers and the workshops that are coming up. Uh, it really is a remarkable program, and I'm excited about learning from you on, uh, on a whole range of things. And, and the work that you all are all doing uh, is, uh, is reflected in this, uh, in this program. So I'm gonna just go ahead and see if this clicker will work. <laughs> So before I begin, I wanted to take a moment and recognize uh, some of the folks uh, as we've been doing a little bit of recognition uh, who have been involved in uh, putting together uh, the conference that we have today. Uh, and the FEMC <coughs> staff, Jim Duncan, Min Pendle Pendleton, uh, John Pontius, and John Trong, uh, as well as uh, Joanna Garten, from the Vermont Department of Forest, Parks and Recreation, and Tom Rogers from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department. They have worked extremely hard to get this conference together and to, and to bring you this program today. And I just want to recognize them, all of their hard work, and, uh, and, and by uh, the number of people that are here today, it's clearly paying off. So a warm thank you to uh, all of you. So, here is um, a little bit. Uh, okay, so the uh, I just want to get into a little bit of the, the shameless commerce department about outreach strategies. Um, we, as uh, um, Jim was saying, we're um, we're DC based, uh, so I'm from DC, here to help, uh, and uh, we're, we are um, mission driven, which means that we work for the good guys. Uh, we don't take on work otherwise. We're sustainability focused. Uh, and we work across uh, different areas of that, some social, but mostly on the environmental side, uh, and we're very policy-oriented. So most of the work that we do is focused on, uh, on policy and, and advocacy, so the topics that you're covering today uh, are going to be super important for, for that. And, the, um, and some of the clients that we work for uh, are up there as well, and so we work for foundations, uh, governments, uh, NGOs uh, and and uh, and the like. So um, those are those are some of uh, the folks that uh, that uh, we've worked with, and we've been working across different areas. We've done some Red Plus work uh, for the governments of Norway and Guyana. Um, although most of our work is not forestry related, a lot, we do a lot of work on air. Um, so before we begin, um, I would like to level set us. I'd like to get everyone on the same page. And 
humor me for just a second uh, as we as we do this. Um, I would like everybody to please close your eyes. Close your eyes and now <coughs> picture a place where you feel at ease, where you feel comfortable, and where you feel happy. Listen to the sounds of that place. Breathe it in. Now keeping your eyes closed, raise your hand if you're outside. Now open your eyes. Okay, it is not lost on me that I am talking to a group of environmental experts, okay, and that you might have a proclivity for the outdoors and for natural settings. But here's the good news. That same reaction is evident in audiences across all spectrums of our country. Whether it's New York or Boston or LA, whether it is an urban audience, a rural audience, that same reaction, it's called biophilia, that connection to the outdoors, that connection to our environment, is consistent throughout all of the audiences that I talk to, and in fact, research has demonstrated that it's a common uh, characteristic. And, and this gives me hope, and it gives me hope uh, in a couple of different ways, and I think it should give all of us hope, because the work that we are doing, the work that you are doing, is so critically important right now, particularly right now, particularly at this particular time in history. And the fact is that what we're working on and what we're dealing with is, in some regards, at risk. Not just from, not just from environmental forces, which we all know about, and it is at risk from those, obviously, but it's also at risk from our political system. And I believe, at least, and I'll present my own views here, uh, I believe that, that today presents a particular risk that good communications and good advocacy can help solve. And you have a leg up. People are already predisposed to want and to, to, to accept the fact that the environment is important to them. They want to be part of that natural world, and that is an advantage. So, what are we going to cover today? What I would like to do is take us a little bit at a 30,000 foot level, because we're going to talk a lot about some of the, the particular aspects of uh, communication. We're going to talk a lot about some of the, the tactics and strategies. And what I'd like to do is, is lay out uh, a little bit of a, a broad view of, of where we are. So, I'm going to talk about uh, our communications landscape, where we are right now, uh, talk about some cognitive heuristics, that um, I think are useful in terms of how we structure our messages, how we talk to our audiences. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about audience segmentation and give, give a little bit of a one example of a tool that might be useful in that regard. And I'm also gonna talk about um, some, uh, some motivational models, what, what moves people to take certain action. So with that, uh, hopefully what we'll get is a broader understanding of uh, the context and also some, some understanding of limitations that exist in, in the ways that we communicate. Uh, and then uh, hopefully some practical uh, and useful tips and tools that, uh, that we, can, we can apply. So, today's landscape. Highly polarized, low trust, we have media consolidation, and self-reinforcing selection. I'll get into some of these aspects. So, Today, we have a highly political, politically polarized environment. Yes, I have a keen grasp of the obvious. Uh, and and, and this, is from, this is from Pew, and it shows 1994, these are across uh, 10 domains, it shows 1994 uh, on the very left-hand side for each one of these, and today on the very right-hand side. And, uh, and this is a Pew study on, uh, on polarization uh, they've been doing, obviously, every year. And this one just came out, and it's remarkable for a few things. Uh, most notably, this bottom right-hand quadrant, which should scare everyone in this room, which is looking at, do stricter environmental laws and regulations cost too many jobs and hurt the economy? The divide on that, the red, 58%, and the blue, 20%, that divide is greater than the divide across all uh, partisanship. So, 
I want to point that out in particular. The gap that exists today where we are is greater than it has been at any time that this has been studied. That worries me. The fact that we have a society that is so polarized is, I think, something that should, should, we should look at and we should uh, try to understand when it comes to how we communicate. By the way, one, one before I get into this, one of the, the bright spots in uh, the polarization is Alabama. And how remarkable, what a great day is it when you can say that Alabama is a bright spot in political discourse, right? And, and for me personally, I, you know, I, I, was, I was pleased that a Democrat won, I mean, that's just my, my personal politics. I, I was much more pleased that a, an accused pedophile lost and that women were heard. That is an accomplishment that I was very, very happy about. Um, so this going into low trust, we have, we, have, we have remarkable levels of distrust of our governmental institutions, our societal institutions. We have um, some of the lowest levels of trust that we've seen uh, in, uh, in decades. And this is one from, from Gallup. Uh, this is from Edelman's Trust Barometer. And it looks particularly at four different categories, NGOs, business, media, and government. And what you'll see is in the gray is 2016, and the black is 2017. Uh, already you're seeing a decline in, uh, in, in uh, societal institutional trust, but particularly the last two, media and government, uh, have, are now below, they're distrusted, they're below the 50th percentile. So when we have media uh, losing five percentage points, fake news, uh, in one year, that is a remarkable, that is a remarkable thing. So, um, so that is another aspect of the landscape that we're dealing with. And there's also a generational issue here as well, which is that the younger you are, the less you tend to trust civil society institutions. And that's troubling for the future as well. So I wanted to, to remind us that what we're dealing with when it comes to the generation divide is also very important. We're also living at a time of incredible media consolidation. In 1983, 90% of the companies, 90% uh, of, of media was owned by 50 companies. Today, there are six. Oh no, wait. No, actually there's five. Since I put this slide together, okay, <coughs> Disney has acquired 21st Century Fox. Just in that time alone, there are now just five companies controlling the vast majority. When you have hegemony in media ownership across at, at that level, that should be cause for concern and it should inform how we think about communications as well. Put it in another way. Now, it's only getting worse because, thank you, Ajit Pai. We now have net neutrality that's just gone through and working on making it easier for companies to own media in different markets. So uh, rules that, would, that have heretofore prevented someone from owning a, um, both a, uh, a print outlet and a broadcast outlet are going out the door. Okay, so now um, in a media market, you're, you're going to be allowed to own both print and broadcast. And keep in mind, what we're talking about, especially in rural areas, are, are media markets where there may only be one print outlet and one broadcast outlet, only one. And in fact, when you look at the media markets that exist across the United States, and you look at and you overlay that with uh, how those, those areas voted, you will see a pattern emerge, okay, where there are, there, there are limited number of outlets, you see higher levels of of conservative voting in some cases. And that has a little bit to do with the fact that Sinclair Broadcasting Group owns many of those outlets. I'll just put it there. We also have self-reinforcing selection, which is that when we are seeking information, when we want to get information, uh, the, the channels that we now have for that information, uh, largely, are feeding us our own selections. So the algorithms that are out there that are, that, that, that are being employed 
are bringing, uh, are bringing our own uh, pre-selected information into your news feeds. And I'll give you an example of this. So um, my 1983 Honda Element is dying slowly, actually. It's dying rather quickly. Um, it's pretty shot. So I'm looking for a new car, and I'm looking at plug-in hybrid electric vehicles. Match. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm researching this stuff, and then all of a sudden what I find is that in my newsfeed I'm getting all of these articles about plug-in hybrids, about battery technology, about, you know, about, and, and they're coming from Motor Trend and from TechCrunch and Gadget, and I, you know, and they're interesting, so I'm clicking on them, and then they just keep coming, all of a sudden I'm like an expert on, on plug-in hybrids, and, and how does this happen? It's because of the self-selecting uh, thing that happens, and of course, now we have um, many more channels than ever before to receive the same amount of information that we've been selecting all along. So to recap, we're politically polarized. We don't have much trust in our systems and our institutions. We have centralized control of media to uh, a degree that we haven't seen before, and we're getting high on our own supply in terms of information. So those are some of the aspects of the landscape that I wanted to, to bring forward. Now, because I want to wake you up, uh, I want to present, uh, we're, going to, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We just talked about the macro landscape, we're going to switch gears to the micro landscape, to the individual landscape. I want to talk a little bit about cognitive heuristics and what that means and how that applies to what we're doing as best communicators. So what I'd like you to do, humor me again if you would, uh, what I'd like you to do is to look at the next slide and out loud uh, say the color for the word that you see. And do it as fast as you can. Again, you're not saying the word, you're just saying the color of that word. Ready? Go. Great, good. One more slide. Please do this same thing again. Green, red, yellow, brown, orange. I had to wake you up. Um, this, this, what you've just experienced is what Daniel Kahneman, who, by the way, was the original Malcolm Gladwell, uh, described as system one and system two thinking. Our, our brains operate in very, very different ways, uh, in, in, in different ways at different times and sometimes at the same time. Uh, what Kahneman uh, describes is a scenario where we operate with one level of our brains, which he calls system one. Uh, which is our ability to drive a car, listen to the radio, drink coffee, all at the same time, right? We've all done it, we all do it, it's not a problem, is it? Okay, now calculate 76 times 15 while you're doing all those other things. Actually, actually don't do that. Please, especially if I'm in the car, don't do that. Because that now engages system two, which is our, our, our more, it takes more energy, it focuses us on uh, the task at hand, and that's the difference between system one and system two. And so what I'd like to cover is a little bit of how that affects message reception, how it affects our ability to communicate and to receive information. Um, the, the system one, uh, what I call heuristics, but what's referred, referred to as study of heuristics, um, is, is an energy saving device. And Kahneman uh, supposes that, that we have a natural tendency to seek the lowest, infer lowest energy state possibly mentally. That is certainly true of myself. I can absolutely say that for me, that's true. Um, so what he's looking, what he says is that um, we, we have uh, this energy saving behavior and system one helps us save energy. It's also unconscious or subconscious. We make decisions about things at a subconscious or unconscious level. Uh, and it also has a sensitivity for low and high information. What I mean by that is that individuals who have higher levels of information seeking behavior tend to engage system two thinking more 
than those who have low information seeking behavior. So, so think about that from the perspective of receiving uh, uh, information from a source such as television, and then think about that from the perspective of who owns that television source, and think about the choices that may or may not be available to individuals with, uh, with the media market situation that we have. Also, this is a marketer's friend. Marketers know how to use heuristics, and they use them extremely effectively. And they are the ones who are putting this information to work, and we have got to be able to put this information to work because it is powerful. And so if you're familiar with the field, uh, that is great, and you're already using it. If you're not familiar with the field, I would encourage you uh, to, uh, to look into it. I think it will be worth your time. Um, so I want to go through a couple of, uh, just a few examples about um, uh, heuristics and, and, and how they work. The first is, um, that I want to cover, is, is the halo effect of the sequencing. So, um, so this is essentially a, um, uh, a mechanism by which if we like a certain aspect of something about something, so an individual, an institution, a political theory, whatever it happens to be, if we like a particular aspect of it, we tend uh, to extrapolate that to the entirety of that thing, that individual. So for example, here is Alan. And here are some words to describe Alan. Okay? Here's Ben. Now, if you're like the vast majority of subjects that went through this uh, uh, study, you will like Alan a great deal more than you will like Ben. You will, uh, you will attribute much greater uh, uh, respect, admiration to Alan than you will to Ben. And the reason for that is because of not only the halo effect that we automatically uh, start to think about the, uh, the subject uh, holistically, but also that sequencing, those first three words, actually determine how we think about the rest of the information that we get about that individual. And the study went on to separate the first three words from the last three words about the same subjects and ask people, could this possibly apply to the same person? And people said, no, of course it couldn't. These are two, okay? Now, we don't like Ben because of that sequencing of that. Now, we would like Ben even less if his name was Wynn. And by the way, I think Wynn is a great name. But names that are difficult for us to pronounce, that are not familiar to us, we, we tend to, to, uh, to not like. And, and it's, it's a subconscious reaction, but in fact, stocks that have ticker symbols that are words as opposed to just a bunch of letters actually do better over the long term than uh, stocks that are just letters like TRX. Um, so, You've heard of a WYSIWYG in, um, in terms of design. What you see is what you get. This is what you see is all there is, WYSIADDY. Uh, and WYSIADDY is basically a, a heuristic that says, look, I'm going to make a decision about something based on the information that's in front of me and nothing else. Because, again, we tend to be low information. We tend to seek low energy when it comes to this level. So when subjects are presented, with what we all know from this diagram to be two of the same line, length lines, uh, because of, of Wizzyati, people will automatically assume that the top line is longer and they won't challenge it. And when you tell them to challenge it, when you get out a measuring tape and you look at it and you, you measure it, they will still not believe it. So what you see is what you get is, uh, is an heuristic that, that helps us uh, that makes it, uh, our minds able to make quick decisions quickly uh, and uh, without all of the information that we might need. So availability is the, is the effect that if you are able to recall something quickly and easily, uh, you tend to overestimate how frequent that thing happens. So the ability to remember something that is, that is um, vivid overemphasizes your uh, natural instinct to, to, you will overestimate how much that happens. And this is why, for one reason, why crime is used so much as a political talking point. Uh, because people can visualize it very easily, they recall it, and they actually extrapolate, they, they think it, it happens much more uh, than it actually does. So, so those, are, those are some examples of cognitive heuristics. 
I could go on. You're thinking, oh my God, he's going to. Um, but I'm not. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop there, and I'm going to go into a little bit uh, a further uh, discussion about how these things uh, come together. So I believe our current landscape encourages and reinforces the use of heuristics. When you have high media concentration ownership, when you've got low trust, uh, when you have a, 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 a highly polarized society, you are, you are uh, making decisions based on self-reinforced information uh, trends. My, my uh, suggestion to you is that heuristics play a greater role today in our current landscape than they have in the past. And that, I think, is something that is both troubling, but it's also something that we need to be paying attention to in our own work as communicators. We can do that by thinking about how do we use heuristics to sequence our messages, how do we frame our stories in ways that will be attractive and will pr provide low mental energy use for people. Don't make things hard, make them easy. Use names that are easy to remember. And understand your audience. Understand where there are low information audiences, understand where there are high information audiences, and understand how those audiences engage with your messages. Because if we don't do that, then we're ceding ground to others who are doing it. And believe me, the exons of the world know how to use these techniques effectively, and they employ them effectively. So, I'm going to move on to uh, a couple of different models for uh, looking at audiences and also talking about messages. So this is all great, high level, high level stuff. But where where does the rubber meet the road in terms of um, who are who are our audiences and what motivates them to take action that they might not otherwise take? So with that, can somebody give me an example of an audience that you might want to communicate to? Fire? Fire. Fire. Landowners. Landowners. What else? Appropriators. Appropriators. Town meeting. Town meeting. Excellent. Excellent. Okay. All right. All right answers, right? Um, so what I want to present is a is a model that you might think about in terms of how to categorize your audiences, in terms of how to, um, to think about targeting your audiences. So four different, um, four different categories that, uh, that you might want to think about that, that might help to segment and, and focus you in on those audiences. What I call architects. These are the people who help you design the change that you're looking to create. Okay? They can be allies. And by the way, these, these, these are not mutually exclusive. When you look at these, keep in mind they're they're cross boundaries everywhere. Um, so it's, it's not meant to be hierarchical and it's not meant to be mutually exclusive. Uh, but it's just a tool to help think through some of your audiences. So architects are those who help us create and design the, the change that we seek to make. Influencers don't have the power to make that change themselves, but they have the power to influence those who do. So influencers are an extremely important audience. Decision makers, and those are the people who, or the institutions, that have the power to affect the change that we're looking to create. And then lastly, the implementers. Don't forget the implementers because the rubber meets the road with the implementers, right? We've all had great policy outcomes that were implemented pr improperly, and that's not a good place to be. So uh, implementers are those who carry out the change that we're seeking to make. So that's just a, that's just a model to, uh, to think about and uh, there are lots of different ways to segment audiences, and I'm not suggesting that this is certainly not the only one, and not the, not the best one, but it's a way uh, to think about your audiences and to connect with them in a way uh, that might be, uh, might be relevant for you. Oftentimes, I think we, we, we talk about communication, we get right into the, to the nitty gritty, which is great, of strategy and tactics and everything else, and we forget sometimes to think about why people take action that you want them to take. What motivates them? What makes them want to do something that they otherwise would not 
would not necessarily do. So I think you know, as we as we think about communications, as we think about what we're uh, what we're doing, it's important to remember what motivates people. So I put together um, some categories that, uh, and there are other there are other models, and, and again, many better that um, just simply look at the, the major motivational factors across social science about why people take certain aspects, certain actions. Financial. Of course, right. The the, the financial the financial pressure, uh, imperative is, is clear. Uh, it's it's uh, it's self evident, and financial issues are and, and financial motivation is, is a big part of it. Okay. Interestingly, peer pressure is actually just as powerful a motivator as the financial. Uh, when when somebody that you respect and know is doing something that you feel that, that uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of play and, and peer pressure uh, is, a, is, a major, uh, is a major issue in terms, of, um, uh, in terms of how people take actions that they might not otherwise take. Similarly, competition is also a big motivator and is something that, uh, that, that we, have to, we have to take into account. The next two are what I call um, inner circle and outer circle. This refers, inner circle refers to our, our, the, the motivation that we want to help ourselves and the close group of people that we have as allies and friends, our inner circle. Outer circle is more, more humanitarian, more altruistic, people that you might not have met, uh, society at large, et cetera, is also a motivator. So the motivation model is just a way of thinking about how are your messages connecting to, how is your program, your communications program, connecting to your audiences in a way that wants to make them take an action that they might not otherwise have taken.